Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of the witnesses. And, and let me say, I agree when I hear my friends on the other side talk about tired old arguments. And one of those tired old arguments is based on a different world order than the one we live in today. It's an argument based on, on scarcity rather than abundance. And many of the arguments they make are not relevant in today's abundance of natural resources. And North Dakota is the evidence of that. The other argument that I get tired of hearing about is that what are we all complaining about? After all, oil production is up. And let me say on behalf of the citizens of North Dakota, you're welcome. <laughs> but, but the other argument I've, I've grown weary of is this argument of those awful speculators. And it's one that should be put to rest. And, uh, and we have an administration that has without question, uh, wants to limit supply so that they can force reduction of demand. And they want to limit demand. I mean, the president in the State of the Union address just this year said, I propose we use some of our oil and gas revenues to fund an energy security trust that will drive new research and technology to shift our cars and trucks off oil for good. Now, I don't know about you, but we're not, we take oil and gas money to make oil and gas extinct. I'm not sure how that's going to continue to be funded. So he wants to attack the demand side. And he wants to attack the supply side. When the former Secretary of Energy calls for $7 gasoline, you know that that's a priority. So to put this topic to rest, I want to submit, Mr. Chairman, to the record, this uh, MIT uh, study, The Simple Economics of Commodity Price Speculation. If there's no objection, that will be submitted into the record. Now, this is one of the better things that come out of Massachusetts in quite a while. And the, the, uh, the author's key finding was, although we cannot rule out that speculation had any effect on oil prices, we can indeed rule out speculation as an explanation for the sharp changes in prices since 2004. Unless one believes the price elasticities of both oil supply and demand are close to zero, the behavior of inventories and futures spot spreads are simply inconsistent with the view that speculation has been a significant driver of spot prices. If anything, speculation had a slight stabilizing effect on prices, end of quote. So the facts of the study speak for themselves. Another thing I want to get to in terms of questions, we've heard a lot about big oil. We hear about it all the time, speaking of tired old arguments. I come from a state where people could claim that big oil is getting rich. I would like to ask each of you, which economic class benefits most from oil, enhanced oil production? In North Dakota, I've noticed the middle class has been the, the class that has done the best. We've got more people in the middle class. We've seen people move up within the middle class. What would, what would be your response to, to this, the, only, the rich keep getting richer argument? Well, let me start with I'm a native of Pennsylvania, former dirt poor country boy. And driving through the Marcellus right now, I see things I never saw growing up, help wanted signs, that you had an area that had very, very poor for 100 years. And now folks can graduate from high school with some technical training and support a family. And that's something we've never seen before. And so those are the first folks who benefit the direct workers, the suppliers, all the local communities that are doing from restaurants to car dealers to everybody. It's the full community that's benefiting from it. And it's also the retirees who happen to have their investments in those companies uh, to support their retirement. Mr. Kramer, um, we we spent some time with, with uh, API and some other groups trying to uh, quantify the overall impact that the unconventional revolution um, up in the Bakken and, and elsewhere have had on this country. And uh, perhaps the, the numbers that were most striking were what the average wages were in this industry throughout the country. Say, for example, in West Virginia, it's over $97,000 a year. That's the average. I mean, that's not to say that people don't make less than that, but they're making well in excess of double the statewide average. In Pennsylvania, it was about $96,000. In North Dakota, it was about $94,000. So these are, uh, these are very high paying jobs. Uh, many of them uh, are very highly skilled but don't require college degrees and therefore pre present one of the only, um, only jobs markets, especially in a flagging, a flagging economy. Congressman, I would say that the, um, the, the greatest nexus for uh, the middle and, and lower class to, uh, to oil production is largely what they pay at the pump, which is entirely unaffected by increases in production. Their energy costs and their, uh, their cost at the pump 
will not go down as, as production increases. I would also say that they are the ones who suffer the most uh, from the external cost of oil production, uh, be they pollution or uh, increasing uh, events of extreme weather and climate change that affect the middle and lower classes far more than, uh, than the upper classes do. Uh, May I challenge that? that? That is absurd. If you look at the average gas consumer in the United States, they have seen significantly lower natural gas costs. That's an absurd statement. Uh, n not just natural gas, but also gasoline. I mean, you, people uh, are operating under the same uh, metric of 10 years ago that the U.S. could never produce enough to change the price. Well, it's clear that it has to the point where WTI has dislocated from Brent crude to the point where we are realizing a uh, upwards of a 20 to 30 percent discount for oil paid here, and that is that has empirically translated into lower gasoline prices in this country than we otherwise would have had, and certainly in comparison to other states around the world. That, that, that may very well come back into equilibrium sometime in the near future, but to say that it hasn't had an impact is just patently false. Thank you. Obviously, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, and I regret that we can't get into a discussion about the difference between a subsidy for one form of energy and a deduction of expenses for another.